Thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, even though it's just three verses that he read, uh, it would be nice if you guys could have your Bibles with you so that you're not so lost in terms of uh, what the, you know, the whole entire sequence of events would be. I've got to bring the clicker up. Just give me a minute. <laughs> Yes, so always glad to be able to share the word of God because each time I think as pastors, uh, when we prepare the message, we ourselves encounter the truth and the message is preached first to us. Come, let us, let us pray. Father God, we give thanks because you are that true king and today as we reflect upon what that means, what it means to honour you, Father, help us to look within our lives and let your spirit speak to our hearts and our spirits that we may turn from our ways, that we may look to you, Lord. And we pray that, Lord, that you will anoint the time ahead, that, Lord, that you will be with us. We pray all these in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, today, as we think about the topic about God being the true king, you know, and as we look through the story of Daniel 4, you know, I want to say that it teaches us some truths about what it means to honour God as king. And hopefully that will help us to better live a life that honours him in all that we do. But before I go into it further, I think I want to spend a little bit of time about talking about honour. You know, what on earth is honour? Well, it can exist as something, you know, like one's sense of honour, whether this person is honourable or not, you know, or has some sense of honour, like, basically. Or it can also exist as an action, like the act of honouring uh, someone by doing something. So, long ago, there was this, this sculptor, you know. He was working on a block of stone that would eventually stand on top of a very tall column. And, you know, he spent a lot of time working really hard and making sure every detail was perfect, everything was, you know, the right dimensions. So, a friend walked past and said, why oh, you spend so much time detailing all these small little dots and specks and all that? Uh. Nobody's going to see it. Why? It's going to be so high. Uh. Why you waste your time? And the guy, the sculptor, replied, well, God will see it. Well, in this case, honour is the act of doing something, even though no one alive on earth would see it. But who was this guy really honouring? You know, the sculptor himself said he was honouring God. Or for the skeptic, you might say, nah, he was simply honouring a set of work ethics. You know, this guy very have a lot of integrity. And when we say that this person is an honourable man, for example, um, it often means that this man would not take advantage of a woman. In other words, what people are really saying is that this man, you know, out of his honour, would respect the woman and not his own desires or wickedness. No, whatever it is, the act of honour, you know, often insinuates that one is acting not out of his own selfish desires, like what he wants, but out of a respect to something or someone else other than himself. And Daniel 4, if you were to look at the story, in a nutshell, I'm going to go and condense it, it's a very interesting record of King Nebuchadnezzar's bout of insanity, you know, his story. And it begins from a written point of view from the king himself. You know, he's writing this or talking about this after the act. Um, he's the one telling the story. So basically, King Nebuchadnezzar um, has had another dream, a second dream in need of interpretation. And as usual, all the people around him, the wise guys, you know, they all couldn't interpret. And it was, again, up to Daniel who could have that gift of interpretation. Bad news is, it was a bad report. King Nebuchadnezzar was prophesied through the dream to lose his sense of reason and self. And exactly one year after Daniel's interpretation of the dream, all came to pass. But I want to say that the Bible does not dwell too long on that bit about what happened in that one year, you know, how he was humiliated. You know, it was very fast, it was very quick in that part. It continues quickly to the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar's reason, you know, after when he was finally restored, the Bible spent more time talking about how he praised God. You know, the king praised and honoured the God of 
Daniel after his restoration and clearly was also clear-minded enough to tell this story as we know today. So what was the whole point of the story? Well, growing up, I often uh, just thought of this story as, uh, or rather it's been used to say, hey, don't, don't be so proud, ah. don't, don't worry young too much. Ah. You know, it's usually a story that cautions us against earthly pride, and rightly so. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar has throughout our series on uh, Daniel so far repeatedly shown himself to be a man whose ego was so big that he could easily be influenced to kill people if it was threatened. You know, just last week, we saw how um, Daniel's three friends were thrown into the furnace simply because they refused to bow down to a statue of him. Can you imagine, just for a moment, what kind of psyche is necessary, you know, to kill three people through such a cruel method because they just because they don't want to bow down to a statue of you, you know, what kind of psyche would that require? And so King Nebuchadnezzar was truly a symbol of pride, of ego. But as we take a closer read, you know, perhaps there is a bit more than this cautionary tale of pride that can be gleaned. I'd like to draw your attention to the scripture that was read for us today in Daniel 4.27. So in response to, you know, that terrible interpretation of what will happen to the king, Daniel then counseled, you know, therefore counseled the king to break off his sins by practicing righteousness and his iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. Daniel was basically advising King Nebuchadnezzar, at that point in time, the king of the Babylonian Empire. The, the, to them, it was the whole world already that you know what, there is a true king, a true God that you need to pay deference to, that you need to honor. You are not the God of this world. There is a true king and that is not you. And Daniel was telling the king that you honor this God by living this way. Practice righteousness and show mercy. Practice righteousness and show mercy. Brothers and sisters, this tells us that when we talk about honouring God, it's not simply, you know, when we lift his name on high during praise songs or saying words like thank God in your conversations. I mean, those are, don't get me wrong, those are definitely acts of honouring, but they are not the only ways um, to honour God in our lives. Honouring God, honouring the true king of the world is when we live out his kingdom ethics in our lives. We live out the rules of God's kingdom in our lives. And in this case, scripture is clear that it means to practice righteousness and to show mercy. And this idea of righteousness and mercy is something so consistent if you think about it. Even in Micah 6 verse 8, which was in the prayer just now, you know, we read that God requires us to act justly, to love mercy. And then in Psalm 116 verse 5, it says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. So these are two very important qualities and traits, you know, in the kingdom of God. And it's so important because these are traits of God. These are traits that show who God is. So practicing righteousness and showing mercy is as important as it is because these two qualities, when done right, can truly reflect God, can truly honor God. So let's go deeper into these two ideas first. Well, firstly, Daniel 4.27 advises King Nebuchadnezzar to practice righteousness as a way of honoring the real king. But what does this mean? What does righteousness mean? How can we practice righteousness? Righteousness can practice one man. I thought you have it or you don't have it. You know, in, in Matthew 5, let's see, uh, it says uh, through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it tells us that righteousness is the obedience to God's commandments. Righteousness is essentially the obedience to God's commandments. And we know now, also through Jesus, that the commandments can be summed up into two, to love God and to love your neighbor. To love God and to love your neighbor. Sounds simple, but I think so hard in reality as we all would be able to testify. Because, well, a lot of times it seems as if these two are at odds. So, for example, this whole entire issue that has been rising about homosexuality and all that, 
you know, we want to honor God by loving Him and hence pronouncing that, yes, homosexuality is a sin. And yet we are accused of being unloving, you know, in the way we are doing it to those who are struggling with the matter. So clearly to love Him and to love our neighbor is actually not so simple and straightforward as we, we hope, you know. But if done properly, I truly have faith that according to the will of God, we would be expressing the true righteousness of God. And so practicing righteousness actually requires wisdom and practice and an ever-deepening knowledge and relationship with God himself. Because the righteousness that we want to reflect is not the world's righteousness, it's not our own sense of right and wrong. You know, nowadays we say, in my opinion, you know, we always say such things. Uh, we have our own moral compass, we are our own gods. We are not trying to reflect our own righteousness, but we are reflecting God's righteousness. Well, I have an almost 10-month-old. Next week, uh, he'll be 10 months uh, at home now. And honestly, it's been amazing to see him grow into a, a proper human. <laughs> um, my, mom, uh, my mom has a little dog called Juicy. La, okay? and, and the poor dog has been terrorized by the boy uh, every week. Um, you see, he does not really know how to interact with her. So in the past, it, it kind of moved on. You know? At first, he did ignore her. He didn't know that she was alive. And then that moment he realized that she was alive, he started crying. So in the past, he used to think that, he wa that she was just a soft toy. And then when she, he realized that she was alive, then he was scared. But then later he became curious. And then he started to reach out to want to touch whatever he was curious about. And well, he basically doesn't know how to interact with the dog. Lah. And he has very poor muscle control and he's still learning, right? And so basically, whatever, he, he, whatever it is, he will basically pull, reach out and pull, grab her fur and pull and tug. And, and, and that poor dog, you know, I thank God that she has such a mild temperament <laughs> and she doesn't retaliate. But you know what? Slowly, week after week, whenever he visits my mom's house, my mom would show him, you know, um, how to sayang, you know, how to pet the dog. You know, don't, don't grab, you know, sayang, you know, how it should be done. You know, how to interact properly, how to conduct himself rightly with the dog. And recently, just a few days ago during National Day, this, uh, this happened, okay? Baby, no! <laughs> yeah, so as you can tell, um, if you can hear my, uh, I think this part I cut it off, right? But my mother's uh, comment at the back, her proud comment was like, I teach him how to sayang one, you know. So every week, basically, she will train him, you know, how to sayang. Um, and, and, and after months of seeing, of learning and practicing, and clearly needs more practicing, because I think that video really showed like, a bit like hit and run, uh, you know. <laughs> he was like, oops. Um, but, but, but to him, it was, I'm trying to pet, you know. He was, he was like, no longer pulling and tugging already. You know, he has learned how to conduct, basically, himself more rightly with the dog, you know. And this is so much like how we also learn righteousness and practice righteousness in our lives. We need to be in an environment that will help us and teach us what are God's commands and how to live them out. And we need to practice it also. Perhaps you would still be very clumsy in the way you exercise it, but don't worry. If you continue to practice and watch the Father closely and understand His will better, surely you will mature. Watch the Father closely. Spend time in the environment that will help you learn and understand. So, brothers and sisters, have we spent time knowing who He is? You know, we always have our own imaginary ideas and assumptions of what is God's love. You know, we'll talk and talk and talk, but have we actually gone to the scriptures? Have we really, like, sat down and prayed through and let the Spirit help us understand what on earth does it mean? Have we made sure that our priorities have been set in our lives to make sure we know who He is? You know, we are often, always, when we say, uh, you know, spend time, I don't know, time, la. you know, life is so busy. So have we made sure that our priorities have been set in a way that helps us to make sure that we know who He is? You know, if we only reduce our time of knowing God to half-hearted attendance at church and prayers to simply at meal times or when we are ill, how can we ever know? How can we ever know? And especially in this time of our lives and our history, when the issue of 377A and all that is growing to something that demands a response from us, 
how can we practice God's righteousness if we do not know who he truly is? And for the parents, you know, how can we expect our children to be able to live righteously in the Lord if their spiritual education is much less prioritized in comparison to their earthly ones? How can we all honor God by practicing righteousness if our ideas of God and who he is is fragmented at best and full of assumptions rather than truth? You know, no, no wonder it seems that more often than not in our efforts to practice righteousness in our lives as we try, often people don't see God but the condemnation and evil that instead we reflect. So as you can tell, I'm actually still not telling you what to do specifically, like what is right, you know. Because righteousness is not limited to specific actions. It is about reflecting God's righteousness and, his, and who he is. You know, that means it's not simply actions, but it's also an attitude, a way of being that is expressed through your body language, your actions, and your words, and your thoughts. It's a way of living that expresses God's righteousness, that honors the king's kingdom's values and rules. So honor God the king, honor God as king by practicing his righteousness. Now, the second quality that we spoke about was that of mercy. And in Daniel 4, it says specifically to show mercy to the oppressed. The raw translation of this phrase will actually be show favor to the poor. You know, show favor to the poor sounds quite dull, la, you know, and quite politically overused even. You know, being nice or doing acts of mercy for those who are down and out is such a common refrain. But if we were to remember that this was actually asked of King Nebuchadnezzar, it may have a slightly different nuance to it. Daniel was asking the king, this super ego king, who has real earthly power over the social structures that oppresses the poor to have mercy, to show favor to them. It was an ask of him to do something with the power that he had to a group of people that were suffering because of the structures that maintains his power. And this could really mean that he would have to, you know, perhaps take money out of his treasury or his taxes, you know, to benefit the poor. This could really mean that he might have to piss off some of the elites, you know, within his kingdom who may be more pleased with the status quo. It will basically mean that he has to rock his boat, be uncomfortable, and even lose wealth or income. God through Daniel, was challenging Nebuchadnezzar to honour him as the true king by being loving even when it will cost, even when it will cost. And perhaps this is the sort of mercy that God looks at, that we do not simply do, act, we do, like, we do, not simply do acts of, uh, token acts of charity, you know, to feel good about doing nice things, you know, that we can give spare change. But we love even when it will cost us, even when there is nothing to be gained in return. So there was a young boy who was very, very naughty. I think we all can think of somebody like that. You know. He gave a lot of problems to his teacher uh, to the point, honestly, any teacher would have simply left him alone, probably isolated him away from the rest of the class and just moved on. You know, his parents were also not very interested in being engaged uh, with the school or to help discipline the boy. You know, but his teacher had compassion upon him and decided to be merciful. He did not write this kid off, but he stayed back weekly with the boy during the detention that he gave him. And during every detention, he would take time to read a book with him, hoping that this will help improve his English. Well, slowly, the boy did accomplish quite a few books, but you know what? He was still very naughty. In fact, one day, he stole from the teacher during detention. And when caught, he laughed and said, ha ha, you're so stupid. You know, the teacher was quite hurt, you know, when, when this happened. And, and honestly, there was a moment in time where the teacher could have said, you know what, uh, it's not worth it. Yeah. But he decided to choose some mercy and compassion instead. You know, after the incident was over uh, and discipline was enacted, the teacher continued to love this boy by continuing that weekly reading. And after the boy graduated, without even much of a thanks, to be honest, the, 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 the whole entire thing ended. 
And the other teachers commented, wow, this student are uh, really like not worthy. Uh. To which the, re the teacher replied, which is why love was all the more demanded. Which is why love was all the more demanded. Loving, even when it costs us, even when there is nothing to be gained in return. That was the kind of favor and mercy Daniel may have been asking of Nebuchadnezzar. The king who had all the riches and power in the world, you know, go and love those that has absolutely no use to you. And this action may even bite you back. And by doing so, perhaps you may please the true king, whose kingdom aspects is about true mercy. And so for us today, how have we shown mercy, shown love to the people in our lives, those who are societally less privileged than us, those that we would have power over in our lives? And perhaps I'll raise a possibly sensitive topic. How do we treat our domestic helpers in our homes? You know, it's a common thing in our society to hear of domestic helpers, especially, you know, since we have very limited room in our houses to you know, sleep in a small corner of the kitchen or not even have a proper space for themselves. You know, they often eat by themselves in the kitchen or sometimes even on the floor. They are introduced as the maid or the helper and not by their names. Uh, you know, one day off a week, you know, in the, in the forums often uh, when, I, when I see it, sometimes there are like a lot of uh, discussions about how even one day off feels like a luxury, you know, for them. And this is so ironic because Singaporeans are writing articles after articles these days about promoting three to four day week, work week. How do we treat our domestic helpers at home? And how do we also love the helpers who are here with us every week in church? You know, I, I confess, I, I usually simply talk to the elderly uh, that they are sitting with or, or even the baby that they are carrying um, and may totally ignore them as a person altogether. And you may say, Pastor, don't you know, sometimes we treat the helpers too well, maybe they might cause trouble. Or some say, Pastor, no choice, I, I need help with my children every day, you know. And, and yes, I also hear a lot of stories and I have experienced it myself in my own um, family environment that, uh, yeah, there are, there are like horror stories and cautionary tales of domestic helpers stealing or causing problems. But while I do understand that these stories are true, but let them not be a reason for us to withhold favor and love to every helper that we meet. I don't think that should be a reason. Loving, even if it may cost us, that was the kind of mercy that Daniel was challenging King Nebuchadnezzar to. And perhaps that is also the kind of mercy and compassion we are challenged to show as well. That's the kind of love that we are challenged to show as well. And I want to say not only for domestic helpers, but even but if you are a boss or you are a leader of a team or whatever, how are you treating your workers and your staff? How are we treating the cleaning staff in our offices, in our workplaces, our lower ranked staff? How do we show favor or mercy to those whom we will power over? And you know, as adults even, how do we treat our children and our youths? You know, do we simply use them or dismiss them? Or do we see them also as growing individuals worthy of respect and capable of growth? And most importantly, people that God loves and people that Jesus has died for. This sort of mercy is important because it is one that is God-honoring. It is a mercy that reflects the kingdom of God. So honor God as king by showing mercy, even if it costs. So Daniel 4.27 raises two important qualities, practicing righteousness and showing mercy in order for Nebuchadnezzar to honor God as king. But if we were to look at the entire story within chapter 4, one overarching theme cannot be missed. So Daniel 4.17 says, It was to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. You know, this entire phrase was repeated three times throughout the narrative, which clearly shows that the purpose of whatever happened to King Nebuchadnezzar was to drive home the point that God was the true king of the world. And note that Nebuchadnezzar was also what we would consider a Gentile king, and he was the king of the Babylonian Empire, considered as the entire world at that point. And so the statement is clear. God is the true sovereign of this world. And so what does that mean for us? Well, let's look at what King Nebuchadnezzar says at the end of chapter 4. 
So basically, he says he recognizes the sovereignty of God and praises his dominion and lasting kingdom, and how no one on earth or heaven can compare or have any power over God. God has true power. It will not be challenged, a power we can never fathom as human beings. And in verse 36, after giving praise and honor to God, he continues, At the same time, my reason, uh, uh, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. You know, everything, basically he was, and more greatness was added to me. He was, he basically got back all the so-called earthly prestige, and it was, it was, it was as if things never changed. But what was different was that King Nebuchadnezzar rightly returns the ownership of the world to God. So note that he was still king, he had a glorious kingdom, majesty, and, and so even though nothing changed, what was changed was his surrender of that true ownership of whatever he possessed. That now he understood that while he was still king and treated as such on earth, the true king was still God and he has the true power over all. So honoring God as king is by surrendering ownership. It is when you know that you are ultimately not the owner of all that you have on earth, that you are ultimately not the owner. So there was a person who was very smart and capable, you know, through school and then through work. He was always the top performer sort. One day, however, he met with a crisis at work and he just could not resolve. He was just so stuck. And he, he asked for prayers from the church and worried over the issue for quite a while. But, you know, after some time, there was finally a breakthrough. He celebrated this breakthrough by praising God and he said, thank God for helping me with this whole entire problem. You know, wow, usually I can handle all these very easily, but wow, this matter really needed that supernatural assistance. This person continued then to attend church for a while, but, and for a while he was even very active. Uh, because he was very thankful. But after some time, he got busy at work again and started to grow absent. And when brothers and sisters checked in on him, he would say, oh, uh, everything at work is fine. You know, he's handling it quite well, but very busy. Um, thank you for your concern. So brothers and sisters, what do you think went wrong here? What was the problem? Was it busyness? You know, was it because he was very busy? I would beg to differ because that would kind of insinuate that all of us sitting here are very free people. Lah. Okay, and that is definitely not true, right? I think a lot of us are busy as well. So, so what is truly the problem? Note what he said. He said, this, pers this person said, usually I can handle all these things, but this matter really needed supernatural assistance. Basically, in his mind, unknowingly, and I think we are all guilty of that, he had basically split up the pie. Much of his life belonged to his domain. It was his to handle. It was his work, his glory, his abilities. And then when he reached the end of his rope, then yes, God, come and do your magic. It was as if God's domain was simply in the areas of life that he couldn't handle on his own. And for the bits that he could manage, which is most of it, he was in charge. He was the owner. He was the king. Brothers and sisters, I would like to say that this person could really easily be me and you. It's just far too easy for, and common for us to absolutely treat ourselves as kings of our lives. And only in areas where we can't control or manage them, we say, ah, leave it to God. But today we see through Daniel 4 that God's dominion is over all things, it's over all the earth. His dominion is everlasting and enduring and there's no power greater. This means that our achievements, our glory, our work, our children, our families, our marriages, they all ultimately belong to God. He is the true king over all that we have. And if, you re and if we realize that, it should impact the way we live our lives. Because it's no longer about you and your desires, but about what God wants over your work, your children, your families, and your marriages. Only then can the kingdom of God truly break into our lives fully. And I have good news for you in case you are feeling anxious over the thought of losing control over your life. Daniel 4 reminds us that this kingdom is a good one. Verse 37 says, For all his works are right and his ways are just. And so if we live out truly as citizens of God's kingdom, we can experience his righteousness and goodness in our lives and our relationships. So honor God as king by surrendering ownership of our lives. So today we have talked extensively about how we may honor God. And 
often we think about honoring God in a very performative way. We think about you know, how well we perform or show ourselves in doing things. You know, I've definitely been told, and I have said the phrase, you know, uh, please glorify and I want to honor God with my grades, you know, my exams, for example. Because uh, you know, as if, if we did badly, it will, it will dishonor God. You know? it, it's so easy to think about visible earthly successes as ways of honoring God, because that's how culture has taught us. You know? And I'm not saying all these things are altogether wrong. Yes, we can honor God with the stewardship of our grades and our work, but we need to shift our focus away from the visible KPIs. Because to be honest, for example, what's the point of skipping church, avoiding friends, being absent from people's lives when they are hurting, just to get glorifying results at work or school? You know, this tells us that something is more necessary. And honoring God is not simply in the results. And so this is a call to action, a call to not only honor God with our lips and gestures, but to truly defer to him as the true king of our lives. That we honor him as king by practicing his righteousness, not yours or the world's idea. That we honor him as king by showing mercy in a way that may even cost you. Because that's the kind of love that he desires. That we honor him as king by surrendering ownership because we are not the kings, he is. And as we live in such a way, I believe we can truly reflect who our king is. Let us pray. Father, help us to honor you in our lives fully and genuinely. Father, we have been holding on to that crown in our lives for far too long, Father. Teach us how to cast it before the cross. Teach us to lay our children before you, our relationships before you, our marriages before you, our lives before you. Help us to trust that, Lord, that if we were to do that, Lord, you are that good God and that your kingdom is just full of your love and your righteousness and that we have nothing to fear because, Lord, in you, we can find true safety. We can try to find true purpose. So, Father, help us to surrender ourselves. Help us to honor you as our king because you are the true king. We pray all these in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.